Views of his opinions may vary, but few would dispute that late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia was an American original. Here's Mo Rocca to make the case. I could be charming and combative at the same time. It may well be that I'm something of a shin kicker. The late Justice Antonin Scalia loved to argue. That's one of the things I miss most about him, actually, is just sparring with him. Christopher Scalia is the justice's youngest son. He loved it professionally, but he loved it at the dinner table or whatever. It was a, lo a lot of fun. I attack ideas. I don't attack people. And some very good people have some very bad ideas. Justice Scalia, a conservative giant whose opinions sometimes polarized the nation. You want to talk about Bush versus Gore, I <laughs> Believed the road to persuasion was paved with humor. My court owe no apology whatever for Bush versus Gore. We did the right thing, so, so there. <laughs> Your father was famously funny from mm -hmm. the bench. Was he funny at home? He was very funny. He told jokes very, very well. His offhand quips were also very funny. Justice Scalia, who died early last year, wasn't the least bit shy. He was a little bit of a ham. He starred as Macbeth in his high school's performance of that play. He had cameo roles in operas along with Justice Ginsburg. And I think these speeches were an opportunity for him to show that, uh, that performative side. In his speeches, many compiled in a new book, Scalia shared his views on topics as far ranging as games and sports, the arts, and the Holocaust. When I was a young man in college, spending my junior year abroad, I saw Dachau. The younger Scalia reads the speeches for the audiobook. One of his main points in that speech is that progress is not inevitable. Nazi Germany was a very refined, well-educated culture and country, but the people were still capable of committing these unimaginable atrocities. And his point in that speech is to never, well, obviously, never forget. But that specific, backsliding. That it's possible to backslide, yes. Right. I, I care about the original meaning. What was in some speeches, Scalia courted converts to his conservative so-called originalist reading of the Constitution. Sometimes people come up to me and, you know, they, they screw up their faces and say, just, Justice Scalia, when did you first become an originalist? You know, as though it's some kind of terrible disease that you uh, acquire. Did Justice Scalia get you to think differently about the law and the Constitution? I understood his position, and I had to think very hard, uh, was I right in taking a less a literal view? In fact, Scalia and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one of the court's foremost liberals, became what Scalia called a mutual improvement society. So it's good to have someone who is super intelligent and is able to explain his point of view. It makes you think harder. And he felt the same way. It was really important. Scalia's widow Maureen and her late husband and Ginsburg and her late husband, Martin, became close friends, often socializing together. Our adult children would be there. Yes. For me, it was easy. I had only two. <laughs> <laughs> and you and the late justice had quite a body of work. I mean, nine kids, your own Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> but they would have been ahead of their time because they have five boys and four girls. <laughs> There you go, that's right. Close 5-4 split there. If you hold up your hand, be sworn. The two women say such across-the-aisle friendships were more common when Ginsburg and Nino, as he was known, first took the bench. Nino was appointed in 1986, was mm -hmm. it? So help me God. My congratulations. Everyone knew what his judicial philosophy was. The vote in Congress, in the Senate, was 100 percent. It was unanimous. 98 to 0. My approach, I believe, is neither liberal nor conservative. When I was appointed, the vote was 96 to 3, and I was known as a flaming feminist. <laughs> that kind of collegiality, the good relations, people who liked and respected each other, even though they disagreed on some important questions. These days, Ruth Bader Ginsburg finds herself looking forward by gazing back.
You know, 1986 and 1993 are not that long ago, but it does seem increasingly like political opponents now view each other as enemies. Well, my hope is that in my lifetime, we will get back to the way it once was.